and, we, and but then we can and, fight. Mm-hmm. Oh, just just to move on to another topic, which novel of Dostoevsky's is your favorite? The the novel that I like the most is actually The Idiot. I like it more than The Brothers Karamazov, which is quite interesting. But yeah, I have to say it's Idiot. Uh, I've heard someone who, who said that they they like the demons the most. <laughs> An odd fellow, I think. <laughs> I think Demons is actually a profound novel. It's just that I think Demons is the is kind of the book of, I think it's one of the greatest sociopolitical books of all time, but it's not necessarily philosophical, theological books mm-hmm. as much as a Demons is. Of course, Demons has that uh, that element to it as well, but I think it's just a different kind of perspective yeah. towards Dostoevsky's thinking. Mm-hmm. So what, what do you see in Dostoevsky's Idiot? I think... I think what we see most in Dostoevsky's Idiot is this idea of what actually does it mean to be good. And this is something we've been disagreeing over and we've come to some sense of conclusion as after you've, go- you've gone into the full Kantian way, because previously I said beauty shall save the world. And I was talking about how the idiot is actually good. And then for the longest time, my good friend Warren said, how can that be good? His, it is his goodness, which is makes it evil. And as a result, his actions are not good. But then the, my response to that is it is the very goodness of the idiot, despite people using him and despite it leading to evil, which is the very nature of the good act. And I think that is a very interesting thing in the sense that you should do good in your circumstance, no matter your surroundings around you. And even if that causes evil, as long as you've done the best in your situation, then that is good to you and that the problems of the evil created from it is not your problem, but rather the problem of those around you. But (laughs) it seems to me that the idiot feels a bit more than just a simple one should just do as much good as possible. It seems to me that Mishkin has a certain naivety <laughs> and it's almost not like he he cautiously, he's consciously trying to do good. He's just naturally, in, in a sense, good. But then it is exactly his, his natural goodness <laughs> that leaves him stranded on an earth that is that is not so suitable for such such a kind of person i think that's an interesting reading but and i think that is exactly kind of the di- the the dichotomy which you see in the idiot i think you pick up upon that perfectly it's kind of like is yes the nature of good is is good but then at the same time you you put it in a world of evil then it's very difficult to kind of it's very difficult to marry the two things together there's this idea that a purely good being cannot live in uh, in this world, whereas the world cannot accept and would only ultimately use the purely good being to lead to even more evil conclusions. And I think the natural question you have to ask here in this situation is, well, then do you follow the good in this situation? Or, or is there some sense that the good isn't actually as valuable as you want? And I think that is a question. Ultimately, do you choose the good or do you choose a pragmatic nature of the world? And what do you think is Mishkin's relation to Christ? Well, I think that Mushkin's relationship to Christ is very, it's very similar because I think, I think that what Dostoevsky was trying to do, and I'm not saying it, I think because it's quite, it's, it's being quite established, is that he's been trying to, when he's writing The Idiot, to compare or combine the characteristics of Don Quixote uh, by Miguel de Cervantes and also uh, that of Christ and to tie those a few concepts together. And I think that that is, that is a very difficult thing to do because you have in Don in Cervantes's work a very, very crazy kind of mad but innocent kind of knight. But then, on the other hand, you have Christ, which is kind of this archetype of goodness in the world, which is, which is often seen or often mis- misinterpreted as innocence. But I think that perhaps, I think perhaps the relationship between Mushkin and Christ is that Mushkin is. It's not necessarily Christ in the sense that he is he is trying to do good, but rather he is Christ in the sense that he is trying to he's trying to illustrate or he's trying to embody or he is acting out that goodness, but he's doing that in a local sphere in the sense that there's that lack of evangel- evangelism within Mushkin. It's that his actions are which promotes his goodness, not necessarily his words, which is different from the Christ figure. Yeah, I would agree. But you had sort of two formulations of what Mushkin's up to. The first 
the first part you used, uh, he's trying to trying to uh, do good, and then but you sort of shifted on the second part to he's just acting out the good. And I, I, it seems to me, I'm wondering whether you you would go along with me here that, as I said before, motion is almost struck by a certain goodness rather than trying completely to embody them. It's like, I forgot which movie, you know, the very famous movie of like the, the passion where, where like Christ is moving around and he, he seems almost to be, to be surprised that he is the son or he's surprised that he can actually do miracles in some sense. And he's just, he's just chosen and he himself doesn't even know too much. I think, I mean, I'll, I think essentially, well, maybe I think what you point out very well is that that passion, the Christ in the movie that you're talking about, is less so the Christ of the Bible, but more so the idiot, Mushkin from the idiot. So I don't think Mushkin necessarily views himself as good in any way mm -hmm. of imagination. Rather, it's just he, he acts in a certain way which is good by nature. And I think that that is itself, um, itself is the response perhaps that we should be doing good without having that conscious knowledge of it being good and that that is and that kind of ties back to aristotle that you're good by by kind of this practice by this practical wisdom is that it's kind of such a part of your nature that you're doing it that it is good without having to think much about it but this also links to i think i talked i trust this to you a lot of times but it was quite a long time ago when i was heavily reading hannah arendt and it was her characterization of the revolution of Christianity in the realm of ethics. She said Christianity made revolutionized ethics in the sense that one can only be good if one does not consciously strive to be good. Or I think it's one passage in the in the Bible. It's like your left hand, the good of your left hand cannot your left hand cannot know your right hand when you're doing good. And if immediately when you know that you are doing good then your goodness is already using the Kantian term pathologically affected so it seems to me there's this is impossible paradox involved how how can one be good like mushkin as in if one is not like him just just born into it what kind of transformation has to occur well i think that the transformation that dostoevsky is is trying to work towards kind of this meditation of the Bible. And if you look at his letters to different people, he doesn't necessarily t tell people, oh, the Bible says this, this is what you should do. Rather, he says, read the Bible because it is beautiful or read the Bible because it is it is uh, lovely or something along those lines. And and you look at the situation, you're like, well, what exactly does that mean? And I think, I think what uh, Dostoevsky is trying to say is that, well, you, you understand the good via these characters, these biblical narratives, and it is by meditating upon it that you, in some sense, integrate them into your lives. It's kind of like how we tell kids stories without telling them the command of what is good or what is not. And it is slowly by learning these stories, learning these narratives, that people are able to embody that in their lives. Yeah. Uh, well, you mentioned beauty. I think it's a good good place for us to go there because I, I think we had we had quite a long dispute about the conception of beauty between Dostoevsky and and Kant. And it, and just then, it seems to me that you're, you're posing beauty as a solution to what Hannah Arendt posed as this deadlock in Christianity. It is precisely by following beauty that one can do good without consciously striving towards the good. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think there is this tying up about consciousness of striving towards the good, because I I don't necessarily think there's anything wrong with consciously trying to strive towards the good because that's essentially what you're doing by providing the stories. But at the same time, it is by consciously striving towards the good that over time there's a point or a barrier which you go beyond, which, which helps, which helps you know retrospectively that there is, or or not retrospectively, but there is a point where you go beyond where you're no longer acting towards the good, but that has become part of your nature. It's kind of like when you're writing, learning to write for the first time, or learning to play football, the action is forced. The more you do it, it, it suddenly becomes part of your nature that you no longer think about it. And that I think good uh, lies in the same way. So it's like a certain event of like falling in love, but one 
can only retroactively know that one is good after one has become good. And <laughs> the only way to become good is to follow the beautiful in some sense. And, well, I think you know this much more than me. What do you think is the beautiful's role in Dostoevsky's thought? Mm -hmm. I think the beautiful is some sense of solution, I think, to the existential problem. Because, because I think you, you drive back or you tie back to the quote he perfectly says, and, and let me try to get it up for you. Beauty will right. save the world, is it? Uh, <laughs> not that one. I, I, I mean, I, I will talk about that one in a bit, but I think that there's this... Um, there's nothing more beautiful and true than that. Okay, so this is what he says, and I'll share the screen with, with you right now. It's this idea that is that there's some sense of, and I'm not fully sure about how to understand this, but it says, I will tell you that I'm a child of the century, a child of disbelief and, and doubt. I am that today and will remain so until the grave. How much terrible torture this thirst for faith has cost me and cost me even now, which is all the more, the hell is this, uh, which is all the stronger in my soul, the more arguments I can find against it. And yet God sends me sometimes instances when, when I'm completely calm and those instances I love and I feel loved by others. I think that's a silence. And it is at those instances that I have shaped for myself a credo where everything is clear and everything sacred. This credo is simple. Here it is. To believe that nothing is more beautiful, more profound, sympathetic, reasonable, manly, and more powerful than Christ. I think that that is perhaps the, that's the core to understanding Dostoevsky's understanding of, of beautiful. It's this idea that it beauty allows you to enter the realm of silence that we talked before and beauty allows you to understand more about the world or at least more about Christ your understanding of our statuses as beings or and I, I don't want to say beings in a Tillichian sense or Heideggerian sense because you every time you raise you undeniably unfortunately you get back to Heidegger but it's not necessarily that and it's not necessarily a fully Heideggerian or Tillichian way where you're looking at it and it's very difficult to kind of talk about it beyond it but at the same time it, it has to go with it but I think naturally you have to look at the situation and, and state that, well, beauty is that which not necessarily is the good, because I don't think it's naturally the same thing, but rather beauty is the greatest tool in, in your life, which allows you to reach the good, to reach Christ, to reach, to reach the silence. And that's perhaps Dostoevsky's beauty. Mm -hmm. well, my concern or... Mm -hmm. My challenge to this conception of beauty would just be this. I think you you described it beautifully. It's similar to Kant when he said that this judging of beauty is, uh, is a certain disinterested disinterestedness. As in, your interest after seeing beauty is just to stay inside beauty and not do anything else. And in some sense, that's very similar to the silence that we were talking about before. But at the same time, I, how, how exactly does beauty make one good after, after one leaves the state of beautifulness or the state of awe? I think, I think it's similar to practice in the sense that the more you act in a beautiful way, the more you're able to live it out without the beauty and find beauty in almost everything because because in the past, you know, that stage of science I was talking about, you experience it very little. But as time goes on recently, I've been experiencing it more and more, even in the most chaotic situations. I think that that is this idea where, where you're able to find that beauty, that, even that small amount of beauty, which I think always exists in almost everything. The moment that you're able to find that beauty would, be, would allow you to understand more about the global situation or at least allow you to reach that good in a more common sense it's not necessarily about just being with it but you it's about finding it and you can find it everywhere you know what this reminds me of it's 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 one of slavic Zizek's self critiques he's like do you know why i always talk and talk and talk and talk so much because i don't want that moment of silence after we've talked so much where i am finally revealed as this <laughs> impotent idiot or a, a, an important thought can finally be raised. And I think I myself has, has this kind of habit also. I just, I want to talk and talk and talk so much. I don't want the silence in some sense because I feel like 
when one's being silent, one is wasting the moment. And we talked a bit about Heidegger's critique of, of technology. He said technology makes us all into a certain standing reserve and is actually related into a corruption of the notion of causality from Aristotle to onwards, where now we only have the idea of an efficient cause rather than anything, uh, uh, rather than this contribution, the sense of contribution where Aristotle said when he's named cause, but just to skip all of those steps, what Heidegger was saying is somehow we are in a technological age and we cannot help but it's already being thrown. We haven't chosen this age, but it's thrown into it. And our way of thinking is already technological in the sense that, in a corrupt modern sense, in that we always want to utilize ourselves to the greatest possible degree or to make the most out of everything that we're doing. And just making the most, in some sense, is count is counter to the ethics of silence that Dostoevsky is proposing. Or how, how do you think how would you situate Dostoevsky's thought in relation to this Heideggerian critique of technology? Well I think that well I think that um what Dostoevsky would naturally say is he would disagree with the perhaps would disagree with the idea of standing reserve either as a concept itself or as um or its harms, and I'm not exactly sure which one it would be, but it is the idea of, I think there's this understanding of for Dostoevsky that the, the lack of action does not mean inaction, in the sense that when you're being silenced and what you're describing as this fear of not talking because it feels that you're not doing anything, or there's this, and then of course there's the natural connotation of it being useless or, or like you're wasting time or something like that. It is that very act of inaction. It is that fear of inaction which creates the standing reserve retroactively. Because the problem of the standing reserve does, is not found in that silence, that inaction itself, but it is only added to, to it when you're thinking about it from a third perspective. Or only it is only when you're living out that inaction to live out inaction such that it becomes a problem of, of uselessness or that standing reserve. But rather, if you look at that inaction not as something bad, but view it as something beneficial in itself, that that silence can lead to greater understanding, like Dostoevsky, the silence, the beautiful, the good, knowledge of God, then what you see is, is that it is no longer that, the, the problem of the standing reserve then disappears, perhaps, or it's no longer that kind of negative view that you're looking at. And it's actually something which is good. It transforms it. It's a different perspective. Mm -hmm. what, what do you mean by greater understanding? I'm here thinking about one of Pat Arndt's quotes in her last work, The Life of the Mind, where she repeatedly said, I think thinking, thinking's role is not for, for knowledge or truth, but for meaning. And that's why we think. When thinking is done for the sake of meaning. It has no use whatever, but one has to think nonetheless. Do you think what you mean by understanding would relate itself to this? I think it's this search for meaning or this search for understanding which where the where this kind of silence comes in and or at least the utility of the silence comes in. It's like, you know, when you're thinking about or when you're sitting and there's nothing happening, you're silence. You either have a choice to think about nothing or you have this or you think about nothing, but through thinking about nothing you gain deeper understanding. And and it's something really weird, but something where you after you experience it, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And it is that kind of the second type of thinking, which is the thinking that I think Dostoevsky is focusing on instead of the first kind of, I'm thinking about nothing, therefore everything's useless kind of thinking about nothing. Okay. So where exactly does this thinking about nothing lend itself or, or point to? Because now, I, I know it, it shouldn't be, but it sounds rather mystical. I said, I'm just here, and I was somehow touching touching the divine in its infinity or something similar to that. I think there's a difference, perhaps, between understanding about God and directly seeing God or feeling God in the situation. Because a mystic, the, the pantheist, perhaps even the Berkeley, the Berkeley might say, well, I'm touching God in my infinity if I interact with everything because God's in everything. But rather, I think what it is is saying that while God isn't in everything in the same sense that we use it, God can be seen through everything. 
And that I think is a different kind of um, perspective or a different kind of approach in the sense that all things give us a better understanding of being and that, and that's why I like Talish, but I don't fully agree with everything he says, but it's that kind of idea that you can understand more about God through everything. That is not to say that God is in everything. And I think that, that is the key difference. Okay. That's, that's very interesting, but can you elaborate on it a bit more? Mm -hmm. I think I should, re re uh, re uh, what do you call it? I think I should respond to this in silence. But in reality, in reality, I think that to elaborate it more, I, I'm not exactly sure how I'll elaborate it more, but... So what's the difference between seeing God through something and seeing God in something? Well, I think that seeing God through something is, is the idea of that feeling of the divine which you feel through experience. But, the, but feeling, seeing God in something would be to say that I felt God as if God was literally in front of me, which I don't necessarily think it is the case. For example, when great evil happens, you can understand a certain sense of good, or at least that raping is bad or something like that along those lines. But at the same time, that is not to say that that knowledge is found within it, within the action itself, that the good is found within the act, but it is known through the act. And I think that that is the same thing in the sense that not everything contains God, but rather it is via the understanding that silence towards that in which you understand more about God. So let's take the case of the, the great evil, for example, a, a horrible uh, person who, who wants to torture everyone else. So wherein do you find God or how, how do you through that, that act see God? Or is, is it within you or is it within that, within the act? I think it is both within you and within the act. The act illustrates a certain part of your knowledge of the good or the knowledge of the divine, which then emphasizes it into your conscious understanding. The idea of, and this is what I think, Cal, I, I'm not sure it's Calvin or Luther came up with the idea of the census divinis, which is like we are all endowed with the sense of the divine or the sense of God within us. And, and it is via uh, the sense of the divine where we, by searching within ourselves, we are able to find the world beyond us. So that's why it's so important to live in the world is that the actions in the world are the best ways to pull us out of this kind of sense of understanding of the world. And that is exactly what is reflected in what I'm trying to say is that it is these interactions with the world in which it brings out from within us this understanding of the good or of the beautiful. And that it sometimes is via the most despicable things, which allows us to reflect in our deepest nature that something is evil and it is that okay. which brings up the act mm -hmm. okay and how would you connect this with the sense of silence because it seems to me that this acting inside the world is somehow opposed to the silence or uh this uh, activity within oneself as i think cicero mm -hmm. said like i'm never i'm never less active than when I, why I'm alone, or I'm less, never less active than when I am thinking. But then this kind of activity in thinking is very different than the action that you're, you're saying then. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the Dostoevskyan idea of silence is not necessarily silence as in I'm not talking, but rather silence as in understanding that peacefulness. Because when you're peaceful and you're feeling that sense of bliss, that peacefulness, it's not necessarily that you're doing nothing either. It's rather that you're at ease with yourself in the situation. And this feeling of enlightenment, or perhaps, but you can't necessarily use enlightenment without bringing up Buddhist connotations, though Though I think that that is perhaps the best way to view it in the sense that you understand the experience, but that experience is only understood through the, through the action or through the, through the motions, perhaps, of, of the experience. And I'm not exactly sure whether I'm making much sense here, but but there's this idea that it is, it is only through your understanding of the it is, it's like even within actions, you can feel silence. Even when you're doing things, when you're talking with people, you can feel silence. So that peace with yourself, that I am at peace with my situation. I am at peace with my, my state, which is that silence. And that silence can be experienced even in the most rowdiest, loudest situations. Whenever I think about silence, somehow I always have the imagery of, of this very dark room or a very dark place. And just wondering, do you think it's possible? Why do you think that God is always, always so bright? And what? Mm -hmm. can can God be be like that silence and be be a bit darker, in some sense? Well, I think that God is 
I think God is indeed. I think God is indeed. I think God is indeed. I think God is illustrated as the light because the light is seen as is seen as is seen as good because you. But I think that God can be illustrated as dark as well. But it's just that the reason why we view God as light so many times is because God is good and that good is tied in with the light. In at least in psychoanalysis, is that that is the most the most direct thing. And yes, God can be shrouded in darkness, just as you see in the crucifixion, where God is shrouded in the darkness. But that darkness is a symbolic representation that God descends into hell or descends into the darkest areas. It's the idea of of um, Odysseus going through the underworld on his re- return to um, Ithaca. And that is that idea of God in darkness as well. And I think that, that is a possible reading, but it's just so rare that we just normally don't see it. 